Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. In this, our fifth story of the week, we shall be looking at a case from Australia that took place on Father's Day in 2005. Our case today is an absolute tragedy in which three young boys lost their lives. However, was this a case of a loving father whose life was destroyed by a freak accident or a man so calculated that he killed his children decimating the lives of all those close to him? The Australian courts have decided, but some still disagree. I would be interested to hear your opinions on this case in the comments section below. Robert Donald William Farquharson was born in 1969 and lived in Winchelsea, a small town in Victoria, Australia. When Robert was 22 years old, he met a 20-year-old lady by the name of Cindy Gambino, who worked at a supermarket in his hometown. The couple began dating and later moved in together. On the 4th of October 1994, their son Jai was born. Robert, who longed to be his own boss, took a redundancy package from his then employer and bought a lawn mowing franchise business. Their second son, Tyler, was born on 22nd of July 1998 and the couple got married in the year 2000. Money was tight, particularly after the lawn mowing business failed, losing them around 40,000 Australian dollars. After a couple of house moves, they had begun building their own property, which only added to the financial stress. Their third son, Bailey, was born on New Year's Eve 2002. Around this time, Robert's mother had cancer and passed away after a two-year battle. He was plagued with back problems and started to show signs of depression. By the time he sought help for his problems in the autumn of 2004, Cindy's heart was already out of the marriage and in November she asked him to leave. Robert then moved back in with his father. The separation appeared to be strained but cordial and they focused on bringing up their boys. A contractor, Stephen Mool, or possibly Stephen Mools, was working at their house at this time and had become friends with both Cindy and Robert. Stephen was divorced with three children of his own. He was a Cub Scout leader and a Sunday school teacher. Whilst his friendship with Cindy remained strictly platonic during her marriage to Robert, Stephen and Cindy began dating after her separation. Robert was concerned that he would be pushed out of his children's lives, but Cindy was adamant that this would not be the case. Cindy and Robert continued to have money issues. Cindy told him that she was not worried about him paying maintenance payments to her, as long as he paid his share of the mortgage. She would rather see him set himself up in a new home for the children's sake, even gifting him some saucepans and a duvet. However, he told Cindy that it would be illegal for him to hold back payments and was angry at the child support agency about the amount that he was scheduled to pay. The couple owned two Holden Commodores and one thing that Cindy wanted was the newer of the two vehicles. She thought this was fair as she did the majority of the driving for the children. By this time, Jai was 10 years old. He loved football, cricket and karate and loved acting out jokes from movies. Tyler was seven. He was also a joker and loved hot dogs and mud cakes. Bailey was now two and loved the family pets, a dog who he called Woofy and the cat Puss. On Father's Day 2005, Sunday the 4th of September, Cindy dropped the boys off with their father. She stayed with them while they gave Robert his presents before heading home. Robert took the boys to Kmart in Geelong where he bought a cricket ball for Jai and videos for Tyler and Bailey. After that they had a fried chicken dinner. Robert then headed back to their mother's house. As he travelled along the Princess Highway between Winchelsea and Geelong, his white 1989 Commodore veered across the oncoming lane, crashed through a wire fence, travelled through some long grass before running into a farm dam. The car filled with water and submerged. Robert managed to escape just before the car sank to the bottom of the dam, but his three sons were trapped inside. 22-year-old Shane Atkinson was driving with his friend Tony McClelland when they saw Robert dripping wet at the side of the road trying to attract attention. 
The men stopped to see what had happened and tried to make sense of Robert's babbling. He kept on saying he'd killed his kids, had to go home and tell Cindy, asking, What have I done? He told the men that he had had a coughing fit and blacked out. He was panicking and couldn't catch his breath. Shane tried to get Robert to call the police, but Robert refused to call anyone until he had told Cindy what had happened. The men said they would go to the dam and look for the children, but Robert didn't want them to, insisting that he must tell Cindy. Shane agreed to drive Robert back to Winchelsea, and Shane would later say that doing that was the stupidest thing of my whole life. When Cindy opened the door that evening, she was expecting to see her sons returning from their Father's Day visit with Robert. Instead, he stood before her, dripping wet, saying, I've had an accident. I couldn't get the kids. They're in the water. It's too late. Cindy called Stephen to meet her at the dam, and together with Robert raced to get back to the sunken car. At some point, Robert told Cindy that he'd had a coughing fit and could not stop. When he woke up, he said, I thought we were in a ditch. I told the kids to wait there. At the edge of the water, Robert asked Stephen for a cigarette. Stephen was furious. What? Where are your kids? Get out of my face before I kill you. Where are your kids? Stephen dived into the water and began searching for the children. Help began to arrive. Stephen's parents, the emergency services who Shane had called, and also some passers-by. Stephen continued to dive into the pitch black water. Two other men climbed in secured by a rope. A police helicopter illuminated the ground below. Cindy was taken to sit in the front seat of Stephen's parents' car as the search continued. She recalled Robert standing in front of the car with his arms crossed. There was no movement, no nothing. He wasn't doing anything. He was just like in a trance. As the search continued, Robert was treated by a paramedic at the scene. He was given oxygen and then taken to the hospital for examination. The emergency room doctor, Bruce Bartley, examined Robert and made a provisional diagnosis of cough syncope, which is defined as extreme coughing that leads to a brief period of unconsciousness. At around 10pm from his hospital bed, Robert gave a statement to Police Sergeant Rohan Curtis. He said that he started coughing and blacked out. The next thing he knew, Jai was screaming and he was in the water. Jai had opened the door and the car nosedived. He said that, I tried to get them out and I tried to get out to help. Everything just happened so quick. A second policeman asked him gently, do you realise that the children did not make it out of the car? To which Robert said, I gathered that. Robert said that he went under the water three or four times but decided it was better to get help. He also told the officers that he had been on antibiotics and had had about eight days off work over a throat infection that had left him with a troublesome cough. I think the kids were a bit cold so I put the heater on and of course it must have warmed up and I started coughing. Several times he asked the police what would happen to him. I've never been in trouble before, so what's the scenario for me? And what sort of thing's going to happen to me now, like? During the recording, there was no evidence of tearfulness or any other overt sound of distress, nor was there a single cough. Meanwhile, police divers continued their search of the dam, which by now, due to the time that had passed, was considered a retrieval of bodies and potential crime scene. The water was cold with zero visibility and had to be searched by touch. At around 11pm the car was found vertical in the water with its bonnet pressed into the mud at the bottom of the dam which was about 7.4 metres deep at that point. Jai was found face down across the front seats of the car part way out of the driver's door. Tyler was found in the back behind the driver's seat and Bailey was tangled in the straps of his child seat on the rear passenger side. The heater, ignition and headlights were all switched off. By 8am on Tuesday the 6th of September, the major collision police handed the investigation over to the murder department and Robert was interviewed later that day. During the interview he retold the story of what happened in the dam without mentioning diving to find the children, instead saying that he went straight to get help. When asked why he hadn't mentioned diving to get to his children as he had done in his previous statement, he then said that he had but could do nothing because of the water pressure. 
When pushed further about whether he dived, he said, I'm pretty certain I tried to dive. I think I went. Yeah, I did go down, because I remember. I think I was swallowing a little bit of water. Robert did not know why the headlights were off and couldn't recall touching the ignition. He told the police that he had had coughing fits before, but had never blacked out as a result of them. When asked if he crashed the car deliberately, he replied, No, I did not, adding that the children were my life, my world. Investigators were very suspicious of Robert, but Cindy was not. They attended the funeral together, bound by their grief. She even stood by him when, on the 14th of December, he was arrested and charged with three counts of murder. Cindy stated that, I believe with all my heart that this was just an accident and that he would not have hurt a hair on their heads. I don't believe this is murder. The case went to trial at the Supreme Court of Victoria on the 21st of August 2007. It lasted six weeks with nearly 50 witnesses being called. The prosecution argued that Robert's version of events did not match the physical evidence gathered from the crime scene. They also brought in a witness, Greg King, who was one of Robert's oldest friends, who provided details of a conversation that he claimed to have had with Robert a couple of months before the children died. Greg said that Robert talked of his anger towards Cindy, the fact that she had the newer car, that she was in a relationship with Stephen, and that he would have to pay for them to live together in his house. Greg claimed that Robert said that he was going to take away the things that meant the most to her, the children. When Greg questioned him on this, what would you do? Would you take them away or something? He claims that Robert stared into his eyes and said, kill them, adding that he would do it on a special day, saying, and then every Father's Day she would suffer for the rest of her life. Greg assumed that it was all just talk with Robert and did not take any action until he heard about the accident, at which time he then contacted the police. The police got Greg to wear a secret recording device and attempt to get Robert to recall this previous conversation. During these tapes, Robert claimed that what he meant by paying Cindy back was for him to get a new woman, have a new house and a successful business so that Cindy would regret letting him go. Robert insisted that he was telling the truth about the accident. When Greg said that he would have to talk about the accident with his therapist, Robert said, yeah, but for God's sake, please don't mention that sort of stuff because then they're going to have it on a file and they're going to have to go to the police with that. That's going to incriminate me and I don't want that because it's not true. I'm begging you not to mention anything. The prosecution argued that Robert was exhorting Greg not to tell the truth to the police. Matthew Norton, an associate professor and specialist in sleep and respiratory medicine, told the jury that it was highly unlikely Robert had had a coughing fit in the moments before the accident. He further testified that cough syncope was an extremely rare condition and that Robert was unlikely to have had such an attack while driving given the warmth of his vehicle Further noting that, Robert wasn't coughing on the night when exposed to cold air in wet clothing. On the other hand, the defence presented the case that Robert had lost consciousness due to a coughing fit and woke as the car was submerging in the dam. Cam Everett, the owner of the property where the dam was located, said that seven vehicles had crashed through his farm fence in eight years, although Robert's was the first one to end up in the dam. The defence noted that Greg's wife, who Greg claimed to have told about his conversation with Robert on the day that it happened, had no recollection of this. Whilst Greg claimed that he was 80% confident that his recollection was accurate, Robert's defence team suggested that he could not distinguish between facts and visions because his memory had been distorted by his emotional trauma. Cindy told the court that she did not believe her ex-husband intended to kill their children. A former police superintendent contradicted the prosecution's evidence regarding the angle the car would have left the road, making the accident, as told by Robert, plausible. A thoracic medicine specialist, Chris Steinfort, concluded that it was highly likely that Robert had cough syncope on the night of the accident. Chris believed the symptoms experienced by Robert were a classic example. He was slightly overweight and a smoker with a pre-existing flu-like illness. The most favourable witness regarding Robert's behaviour was Gregory Paul Roberts, a social worker and grief counsellor 
who had more than 70 consultations with Robert since the children's deaths. Gregory claimed that Robert's behaviour on the night was normal for someone who had been through what he had. Adrenaline and shock might have caused him to sound incoherent and later robotic, appear emotionless or fail to take in information, adding that if a person had been unconscious, a lot of the disorientation would be heightened. Gregory argued that when one partner is present at the death of a child, that partner will have a strong urge to contact the other parent and because of the overload of information, they can become hyper-focused on this. Once Robert returned to the dam, he would have been exhausted and possibly disassociating from what had happened, making him appear detached. On Tuesday 2nd of October, the five men and seven women of the jury began their deliberations. Three days later, they were ready to return their verdict, guilty of murder. Cindy broke down as the verdict was announced. Her mother fainted. Both had to be taken to hospital by ambulance. Robert looked stunned. He was sentenced to three terms of life in prison without the possibility of parole. He announced that he intended to appeal his conviction. On the 17th of December 2009, his conviction was unanimously overturned by three appeal judges who were critical of the judge, prosecution and Greg King's evidence at the original trial. Robert won the right to a retrial. He was bailed on the 21st of December and released into the care of one of his sisters. The retrial began on the 4th of May 2010 and testimony lasted 11 weeks. At the end of the trial, Robert was convicted of three counts of murder for a second time. He was once again sentenced to life in prison, but with a minimum term of 33 years. Additionally, he was ordered to pay Cindy 225,000 Australian dollars for grief, $75,000 per child. After the second trial, Cindy said, Looking back now, I wonder what on earth I was thinking, but I was in so much pain after losing the children that those first couple of years were a blur and denial was my only way of surviving. Cindy went on to marry Stephen and they had two sons together. On the 10th of May 2022, at the age of 50, Cindy passed away after suffering a medical episode at home. While Cindy initially fully believed in her ex-husband's innocence, she eventually totally believed in his guilt. What do you think? As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you so much for listening to today's story. We shall be back tomorrow with a disturbing crime that was committed during Halloween. Thanks again. Stay safe. Goodbye.